Now we begin with the news that we've all been waiting for. Israel activist Rudy Ruckman, French Israeli journalist David Benayim, and filmmaker Andrew Noam Liebman finally released from prison in Nigeria, where they've been held without charge for 20 days. ILTV meeting with the three upon their arrival in Israel for an incredible and exclusive extended interview. We can't speak, we can't talk, we can't go to anywhere. We, we're really locked somewhere and we're just looking at ourselves. I can't tell you how many times me and Noam looked at ourselves like, how are we here? <laughs> like, how did this happen? You know, we're like behind bars and we're just looking outside like, how did we even get here? A whirlwind end to a very long month for three Israelis. The filmmaking team behind a new documentary entitled We Were Never Lost finally touching back down in Tel Aviv after three weeks of illegally being detained in Nigeria, the first of many locations in their project. How does it feel to be back? I mean, always when you come to Israel, it's all of a sudden that you can come and, and breathe. For me, when I'm out of Israel, it's like I'm holding my breath. And finally, I come to Israel and I can breathe again. But additional, on top of the usual experience when you're coming home, we just went through three weeks in a cage, locked up. Uh, for no reason, we did nothing wrong, we just came there to show the stories of the Jewish life in Nigeria, the Igbos, and although we weren't able to do our full project, we're still not going to stop and we're still going to show their stories and showcase so that they get recognition and people understand who they are, uh, but obviously we're very tired and very happy to be back home. Yeah, it's amazing to be home. It never felt that amazing to like say that we are back home in Israel. For somebody that just met Alia a few years ago, it, it has a lot more sense, but we feel great. We are very thankful about all the people that really worked tirelessly to like help us being back home uh, today after 19 days of captivity, 20 days, I think uh, we would say uh, for the, the, the full period. But um, yeah, it's amazing to be back home. Israel activist Rudy Ruckman, French Israeli journalist David Benayim and filmmaker Andrew Noam Liebman arrested Friday morning from their hotel room under false pretenses and just two days after arriving in Nigeria their conditions described as inhumane. And they just said, you know, you have to come downstairs, there's police downstairs. So we were just getting our stuff ready, our bags weren't even yet closed. We go downstairs and all these men with guns, actually it's ironic, they had Tavors, Israeli guns, and they had black ski masks and their, their chief, who was named Casey, comes and says, don't worry, everything's good, you're invited, you're not arrested, you're just coming for a quick uh, little interview and everything's gonna be done within 30 minutes. And, you know, for us, you know, we didn't want to cause any problems. So we went and, uh, you know, we found ourselves for, for 20 days locked up. I want to add quick that, um, you know, when we initially were taken in, we were very calm because we understood that there was a miscommunication that happened. And coming from Israel, we, we can understand if a country is going to take their national security seriously. But we figured once we go in, explain our story, show them our footage, it's going to be cleared up very quickly. And that's when things just, we didn't get any information. They just continued to hold us there. After the, after the investigation finished, we were just continually held with no reason, with no understanding of what was going on. But in terms of the inhumane conditions, I mean, I can tell you we were put into a cage that was like a, a round room that you can maybe take three, four steps uh, in each direction. That's how small it was. We slept on the floor. There were like bottles of urine from previous inmates that had left there that couldn't go to the bathroom. There was no AC for the majority of the time. Uh, mosquitoes, bugs everywhere. Uh, there was no light. We were just in the dark, in, in heat, sweating on the floor. And this is how we would sleep. And they would keep us there until they would want to ask us questions. And we complied with everything. We answered all their questions. We even provided them with our actual footage to show them. We're not here to do anything political, anything controversial. To the contrary, we want to show a positive image of Nigeria. This is going to show more of a different side that hasn't been told. Of course, the trio tried protests of their own as well when the DSS continued to refuse them any information. At no point were we actually even arrested. Like they, they didn't tell us they were accused of something. They didn't tell us you're officially arrested of something. And their status of invited is what allows them to not allow us to have a lawyer, not allow us to have a phone call, not allow us to have any rights because we're there at our own will. But several times we try to say, OK, so if we're here at our will, then let us go. And they said, no, if you go, then then we'll stop you. And we tried a few times and they again jumped on us and threw us back into the cage. Uh, there's actually one time that me and Noam put our tefillin on and just walked out to the lobby and started like saying, we're innocent, let us out. We made a scene for all the people there, even civilians that were walking into their headquarters. And 10 people came on us, threw us back into the elevator and threw us back into the cage. So we really tried to do everything to, to get out. Um, but we had no, I didn't have my phone the whole time. I didn't have a phone call the whole time. I didn't speak to my family. I didn't speak to anybody. So, you know, the first five days were the hardest because we didn't even know if people knew about us. We didn't even know if people knew we were gone. We didn't know what was going on. It was just 
one moment we're we're there with the community the night before we were really like having a sort of meeting with the, everyone we're talking or going up like late and discussing and then the next morning all of a sudden we find ourselves in prison Thankfully, between the United States, Israeli and French embassies, the families of the captives, and the local Jewish Chabad chapter, which acted as a liaison and provided the boys with kosher food, they weren't left in the dark for too long. Meantime, while the DSS largely refusing to provide details, there are speculations as to what exactly caused this tragic miscommunication. Well, the thing is, there's a movement in uh, Nigeria trying to free uh, the South called, that's what they call it, they call it Biafra. There was actually a civil war back in the 60s and they failed. And so a large portion of the Nigerian population are called Igbos. And prior to the British, they were actually separate. They were their own people. And the British kind of united different ethnic groups and created a country called Nigeria. Now there are def different movements within Nigeria trying to separate and create their own autonomous regions. And these Igbos, a lot of them identify as being Jewish. And there is a state for the Jewish people, it's Israel. So some of those people also wave Israel flags. And when they do certain protests and talk about uh, freeing their country and their land, which again, we have nothing to do with, uh, they associate that to Israel. So all of a sudden you have Israelis coming, saying that they want to do a documentary on the Igbos. For us, it was documenting Jewish life experiences, culture, aspirations. And then you have some bloggers saying, oh, finally Israel's here to help us to free Biafra and all sorts of things that you know obviously were not true. And the government comes and out of nowhere just takes us and takes us away. But I think they knew from the very beginning uh, that we had nothing to do with that. It's very clear. We had made public posts that we had nothing to do with these extremist things. I mean, what our project was doing has been live and, and public for, for a year. And we've kind of got the experience in Nigeria that everything takes very, very long. You you know, very, very slow. And it just so happens that everything on Friday morning, very early in the morning, we were taken and, you know, things happened very quickly. So in our opinion, it was an attempt to silence uh, the voices and the stories of the Igbos. One thing that I don't know if we touched on, and it's that with the articles that were being shared upon our arrival, when people used our images, they completely fabricated a story. They said that the, the leader of this movement had prophesied that when a Sefer Torah arrives in Nigeria, that'll be like the revival of their movement. When in reality, there's already, to my knowledge, at least a dozen Sefer Torot in Nigeria. So they basically saw what we were doing and said, oh, we prophesized this and created this fake narrative. And the government bought the narrative. And even when we presented them with all the evidence and they couldn't find Find anything to hold us it still continued on now that we've been out for a few hours like we've seen how much uh, false information were spread we were taken because of false information being spread so before you share anything out there be careful make sure that you get the information right and like we we we, we were like uh, for real like um, uh, um, uh, collateral damage of fake news so at some point like make sure that even during captivity like we had so many things we people said so many false information so please please be careful don't spread any false information again though as the three continuously maintained their true mission has never been political with the aim being to expose the lives of remote jewish communities and this ordeal has not deterred them at all so when i joined the army uh, i learned very hard the hard way in israel that no means try harder so the fact that they put us in a prison cell in a cage for 20 days is not going to push us backwards. It's only going to push us forward. We're going to take this energy. We're going to take what we went through and we're going to go make something out of it. We're going to continue in different countries, uh, Madagascar, Uganda, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, Tanzania, Ethiopia. Those are the rest of the countries we need to go in Africa. Maybe, you know, we'll be able to go to Nigeria. We always have hopes, but it looks like for the time being, we won't be able to. Then finally, while the first leg of the documentary may have come to a close, the mission in Nigeria is far from over. The filmmakers expressing high hopes to return and finish what they started one day. But more importantly, there's actually still one more captive left to be released. Mother of many children, many of them that we met, that we spent time with, beautiful souls, beautiful people. Uh, she's not just the mother of children. She's also basically a mother for the whole community. She's the le one of the leaders there. Uh, she took us in. She hosted us. She gave us food. She said, whatever you need, I'll be there for you. She took us to see an Igbo king. We were supposed to do a ceremony. She bought me like a whole Igbo gown. And she's really the caretaker for, for this community and the rock and the glue that keeps them all together. Uh, unfortunately, when we were taken, she was taken along with us. Uh, she was with us for the first 24 hours when we were still in a number state. Uh, when we were taken to Abuja, she was taken with us in the car ride. And as as soon as we got there, they separated us from her. 
Um, now, every single time that we received food from Chabad, we separated a third of that food or a fourth of that food. And when we were three, when we were two, we did a third. And we gave her that and we made sure that the DSS officers gave her the food so that she can eat because she's a Jewish woman and she also needs to eat. Uh, when we were released, we spoke with Chabad to make sure that they would continue to provide them food um, and to continue allowing her to, to be able to be fed because the conditions there are just horrible and we can go more in depth at a later time. Uh, but yeah, I saw her one time while we were there because they keep women in a different building. Uh, she was on her way to go see the doctor. I like rushed, gave her a hug, asked her if she's okay. She said, I'm okay, but I'm not feeling too well, so I'm going to see the doctor. And since then, we haven't been able to see her, but we've constantly asked the DSS officer, officers, how is she, how is she, how is she? But we can't believe anything that they tell us. So, you know, we really don't know her situation now. So we really want to, now that we're free, um, not that, you know, it should have been us first and her next, but the reality is that we were free first. She's still there. She's still in their custody. She's still being detained for no reason. Um, and we'd like to spread awareness of her story and the importance of who she is for the community and for her to be freed as well to go back to her family. To learn more about We Were Never Lost, as well as the filmmakers and their unlawful captivity in Nigeria, head to ILTV.tv or to ILTV's Facebook and YouTube channels. This is Aaron Porras reporting, ILTV.